Hi there, welcome back to the channel. Welcome to the fourth video in the restoration of this uh, Sony CRF320, the radio that's uh, been driving me totally nuts. It ended the year driving me nuts, it started the year driving me nuts, and the reason it's driving me nuts now is slightly different. I now have this thing working to a fairly satisfactory degree with one exception. There's a recurring fault that occasionally pops up and it just won't stick around long enough for me to trace it, which is very, very frustrating, but I'm getting ahead of myself there. What I did was I dismantled the frequency counter board and the switching because I was convinced the switching was an issue. I hadn't been able to get in there and actually clean the switches properly. So I started off by doing that. When I put everything back together, <laughs> miraculously, this thing was working and occasionally for very short periods it would fail. Frustrating as hell and I could never capture it long enough to be able to trace it. Because when I do try to trace the, the signal, and the voltages and everything else based on the schematic, they're all there. I've got to catch it when and freeze it, sort of freeze it when the fault is there, which is very frustrating. What I've decided to do in the meantime is order some components, which if you've watched this channel, you know, take quite a while. I think some of the chips might be acting up, maybe, I'm not sure. I may end up having to just replace some and see what happens. I know that's not the ideal thing to do, but when you've tried everything else, Maybe that's the only way out. But in this video, I'll show you uh, what happens with that uh, frequency board and the switching board. I'll also talk to you about the lighting, which perhaps you can see. And the reason it's flicking is because of the camera issue. But I've replaced the LEDs. I decided to go for a different system to the one that's been used a lot. And I think Mr. Carlson was the one who initiated that idea, which is to build a little board with diodes, capacitor and um, a rectifier diode, because the LEDs are actually driven most of the time from AC. And I decided to do it differently because I wanted to do as few alterations as possible and I wanted to make the change almost invisible. And it is. Every light that you see here is an LED, but you do not see the diode and everything else and it's protected with a reverse polarity diode. If this sort of thing turns you on, stick around and enjoy the video. Before we carry on, I just want to draw your attention to the sponsor of this video, PCBWay. You get them at PCBWay.com. They are the company that I get all my PCBs from. And more recently, I've actually tried the 3D printing, which uh, worked very, very well. I tried resin, which is something I can't do myself. Another service they offer, which I have not tried, is the assembly service. And there you can order the quantity that you need of a fully assembled printed circuit board ideal for small manufacturing or small runs of uh, prototype equipment. But generally, if you look at their products and capabilities, the list is enormous. So if there's anything you need, pop over to PCBWay.com. I'm sure you'll find something for your needs. I finally decided to bite the bullet and remove the frequency counter board, the entire board at the top, which has all the switching inside. To do that, I followed the instructions on the service manual, which are actually quite easy to follow. This is almost a paint by numbers. Uh, I follow the, the instructions in the order they give. One, two, three, all the way to, what is that, 15. And it's very clear, as long as you focus on what you're doing, take some photographs and um, follow the instructions one step at a time. And of course, keep these screws separate from the rest so we don't mess that up. I took a lot of pictures every stage. Take a picture, make sure you got the, the information that you might need to put it all back together. This involves removing all the paraphernalia at the back, like the antenna connectors, the actual ferrite antenna. And you've got to be careful you don't damage that because it's obviously got the wires um, precariously soldered on there. I took some pictures of the, uh, the earth strap, everything, basically so that I don't have to scratch my head and wonder how to put it all back. And then, of course, the plugs there, the ones that go into the side, I uh, painted them with different symbols, one, two, and scribble. And so I know exactly how they're going to go back. This is called biting the bullet. It's also called a huge mess. <laughs> this was a really messy job trying to get the um, getting access to the entire uh, board here, the switching board, the frequency counter board. And the result is that I've got all the shields out. I've got everything loose in here. I have actually loosened the switch box. I've got access to the switches at the back here, which is great. I haven't seen anything broken or bent, but obviously I'm not going to take that for granted just yet. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to remove this shield, which has a shield on the bottom. Now this one goes at the top like this, 
and it goes through the board and gets soldered on the underside and it gets soldered to this one on the underside. You can see this thing really went crazy. They went crazy with glue here. But the more important thing is that the amount of solder that was on here holding this down to the board was pretty extreme. There's one capacitor here that I'm going to change, obviously, electrolytic. I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but I'm going to change it anyway. I'm going to check those uh, tantalums. There's, uh, yeah, there's one there. There's another there. What I've done with tantalums is I've actually removed them from the board and checked them properly. I was tempted to replace the tantalums with uh, other capacitors, either small electrolytics or even non-polarized ones, because now I've got them for values that these tantalums represent. But I didn't do that because on um, sensitive circuits, tantalums have certain characteristics which may be desirable. And I don't want to create a problem if there isn't one there. That is always the main issue with these things. You try not to, you know, you try not to make it worse. <laughs> that would be really bad. I've now got access to the bottom of the board. I've cleaned up a lot of the really weird, thick solder connections. I see one connection here, which mm, seems like there's no solder there. That, that is weird. But I'm going to have a quick, uh, not a quick, I'm going to have a very careful look at some of these solder joints. Probably desolder a lot of this and put it back. I'm taking a bit of a page from Mr. Carlson's book because he found a few things that um, were not quite right on the soldering. There's a big blob on here. Sometimes these can be a problem, sometimes not. But ultimately, if you don't find something obvious, you've got to sort of tackle everything. Clean the board, make sure there are no shorts. There was one issue on this thing. This thing was sort of, if you can see that, this edge was sort of bent down. You know, I don't think it was shorting anything, but it, it could have been. But I think the main issue would have been the switches here. So I'm going to get working on this board, clean it up renew some of the soldering, put it back temporarily and see how we get along. While I was here, I also removed that um, the function switch, the selector switch uh, board here, and I checked the tantalums there. There are quite a few tantalums on here. Uh, one electrolytic was replaced, everything cleaned up, connectors cleaned out and uh, the solder remade. I wanted to make sure that that was not an issue and because this whole thing was out, it made access to that quite easy. So that's been done as well. The other thing is I've prepared extenders for these connectors here to reach the top of the board. I've, I've got these here, I've made sure that they're the same, uh, that the wiring's correct. I just wanted some extension here so that I can test this board, the uh, switching board or the frequency counter board, you know, away from here, because I'm gonna have to test it on the top there. So these I've checked, they're working, or at least the connection's good. So as soon as I've checked this board and put things back, tack these uh, shields back just lightly, I think I'm ready to be able to test this, but there's still quite a lot to do on here. It's just a little bit, um, it, it's worse, it was worse than I expected, not because it was difficult to remove this, uh, this whole assembly. The difficult part was actually getting the shields off without doing any damage. Also, you need a pretty uh, powerful soldering iron because these things absorb heat like crazy. So you're trying to, you know, desolder that blob on there. The whole surface absorbs heat, removes heat from your tip. So that wasn't easy. But anyway, enough complaining. I've got lots to do. And when that lots is done, I think I'm going to have to clean up this bench because this thing drives me nuts. And once I put all that back... Basically, this thing is working, and what I've been trying to do, which is what I've started doing since I got back from my little vacation, is I've been trying to get this thing to fail because it has failed. 
I try it on, it works exactly like it did with uh, my comparison with the with the Eaton, um, the satellite, uh, Grundig Satellites M50 clone. I got it to work better than that actually on all the channels, everything was fine. And then every now and then it would suddenly just drop out. And I can't get it to do that, <laughs> which is frustrating as hell because I know there's still something wrong with this. And I just wanted to fail long enough for me to be able to trace it. But when you don't have it stopped, when you don't have it failing long enough to give you time to actually do something about it, that is really not good. So that's what I'm doing. I'm going to do something else. There's some other stuff I need to do on here. And hopefully, hopefully this thing would fail. Because in the meantime, what I've done is I've also ordered a few replacement ICs because I think, I think, I think it might have to do with... Um, possibly those ICs at the top. And I just want to have them on hand when this thing fails because obviously getting parts here takes a, a lot longer than most of you have to wait for. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at little other things I need to do. And I've already done one. I want to show you. So while I wait for this thing to, to be naughty, the dial lamps on this thing were very, very dim. Very, very dim. So what I decided to do was replace them with LEDs. This is, uh, this is the lamp they had on there. And this is actually the insulation tape they put in <laughs> inside the radio. There are a lot of, there's a lot of loose wires at the top just as a result of somebody replacing dial lamps and didn't do a good job at all. So I removed, I started with this one. I, I wanted to see just uh, whether it would work. I removed the uh, shortwave um, dial lamp and I've replaced it with an LED, but I have, I've done it differently to what others have done. There is a very easy mod where you can just put a little a uh, PCB with um, a diode and um, a resistor, current limiting resistor. It's very simple to do, a little capacitor to, to smooth it. I thought I'd do it differently and I want to show you the result and you tell me what you think. Now, this is on at the moment. The lights aren't on unless I put, push light on. How does that work? I can't remember anymore. It's this one here, is it? There we go. You see that? That's an old one. This is the new one. That is the new dial, dial lamp behind the shortwave. Let me put off the lights and show you what it looks like. It looks beautiful. Yes. It's just about right from where I'm looking at it. Just about the right um, brightness. And the way this works is that there's one there, there's one there, one there. There's one behind the, the meter, and I believe there's another one by the clock. In fact, this one by the clock, I think you can see what I mean by shoddy replacement. This one is actually visible through here. They've put a different type of dial lamp on here. And it's just insulated with this. So I'm going to show you what I've done. I'm using a, an LED, a green LED, and instead of using the board, I'm going to use the exact same connectors on the um, on the power amp board. That's where the wires go off for the dial lamps. Basically, that little power power amp board is used as a pass through for all the dial lamp uh, signals. The way this works is that they come on as you push the respective uh, buttons here. So if you want uh, FM, the dial lamp for FM will come on when you push that. But they only do that when you've got mains coming in because they want you to save battery. If you're using battery. You can actually get the light to work if you push it there. That's because I've got FM selected and yeah, this would uh, switch them all on. That one's completely dead, it seems. And there's another two here that are completely dead, but you can put them on to sort yourself out if you're using batteries, but they do consume quite a bit of current. And that's why they make them only work with AC mains. Now, I'm going to show you how I do this. I wanted to avoid putting a PCB at the back. The idea is brilliant. It works very well. There's a lot of space back there. You can put it there perfectly. But I prefer to treat these as individual lamps and make the replacement exactly the same as an individual lamp uh, using a diode um, in the same way. Now, what we've got coming in here is 5.5, let's call it 6 volts AC. These dial lamps are run from a separate winding on the transformer, which I believe is 6 volts AC. I measured 5.5, neither here nor there, but it is AC, so you can't just put a, an LED there because it'll blow it up because an LED 
uh, requires a current limiting resistor. You could probably get away by just using the, an LED with a current limiting resistor because as a diode it would block the half wave and just uh, light up on the other half wave. And um, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to protect the diode itself. So I'll show you what I've done. I've got a whole lot of these green ultra bright LEDs, the five millimeter ones. And I think the five millimeter will be perfect for that. Now, what I've determined is that when you're running them at about 10 milliamps, you've got a lot of brightness. You can run them even lower, much lower, but I tried about 10 milliamps and I was happy with the brightness. That's what I've got on that short wave. So what I've worked out is that to get about um, 12 milliamps, you need about 400 ohms resistor current limiting. Remember what you're doing is taking the 5.5 volts AC, multiplying by 1.414 to give you the peak. But then what happens is if you put this across it, you are going to draw current only on the half wave and the reverse will not go through because that's a diode. However, what I'm going to do is put a 1N4148 diode back to back, reversed. In other words, in the opposite polarity to this LED, so that when the uh, negative half wave, for example, you can't really call it a negative half wave because it's AC, but let's say this is wired so that the positive half wave lights up the LED and the negative half wave will actually be passing through that uh, the uh, 1N4148 and creating a 0.7 volt uh, drop in reverse across this, this one. This LED can handle 0.7 volts, no problem in reverse. It might have a problem handling the, the full 5 volts uh, rectified. These things normally, you shouldn't go over 5, I think it is. So that's what I do. I put this in series there. I put the uh, little diode, the 14148, across, reverse biased to that one, reversed to that one, and create the uh, new lamp. But before I do that, I'm going to scruff this a bit. I want to make it less focused. I want this to be um, matte so it dissipates the light a lot better. And to do that, I just use the Dremel and just pass this over it. That's the idea. It's now completely dull, which is the way we want it. That, if I want to reverse this, I know that I need to put this like that. And so I'm going to, look how small this is. This is the 1N4148. Very small, so it's perfect to put on here like this. I'm going to do that. I won't solder it yet, and I'll show you the result. So here it is. It's across, and I've just got to make sure of the polarity. That's so reverse, yeah, that's fine. I'm just going to clip this. Now I'm going to create a little pigtail on here so that I can fit that in there like that. There's my little pigtail. I'll put that on the, on there. And now I can cut. I'll do that even before I solder. I'll just clip this excess here. Like that. Solder that, solder that. Play around with some heat shrink. We should be good to go. So there we are. That's got my 390 ohm resistor on there. I've got this going to the diode. It'll light up the diode on the one half wave and it'll reverse bias on the on the other half wave, on the negative half cycle. And that means that uh, my LED should be protected. Now I'm going to use some blue and red wire, which is what they mention on the schematic. Make a length of it, give it a bit more than I need, and then I'll put some heat shrink on there as well. And there we go. Another one done. What is it? Three to go? Three or four to go? Let me do them all and then I'll show you what the effect is when we put the um, front panel on as well.
Here's what this looks like now. I've got it on FM. That light's on. The uh, timer's on. The signal uh, strength meter's on. Nothing else. If I change to long wave, that one goes on, that stays on, that stays on. Medium wave, short wave. We get that at the back there as well. Now, obviously you can't see this too well, so I'll put the lights off. Spooky. Okay, there we go. There's our shortwave dial indicated, the, uh, the meters indicated again, as you can see the timer's on, and we'll do the same again. Now this thing is on mains, with mains all those lights light up as they should. When you push the, the light here, it just goes a little bit stronger, you can see that. It just goes a little bit brighter. Um, I believe, uh, I'm trying to remember the schematic, I think when you push this light on, it brings in the, the DC side of it, the 12 volts. Maybe the 12 volts gets put in there. I'm not quite sure. can't remember the schematic anymore. But this thing looks good. It looks really good as it is. It's, it's pretty bright. I've got light coming in anyway. I don't think you'd really ever be listening to radio with uh, this little light on, but this is what this thing looks like and I'm really happy with the result. The effect of the um, scuffing of those uh, of the LEDs just diffuses the light a lot better, otherwise it will be focused. Those LEDs are indeed a lens, so you've got to get rid of that effect. And I like this system a lot better because all it is, it's um, you've got the, the AC volts coming in, you've got a uh, current limiting resistor, and then what you've got is two diodes back to back. Now, if you had those two diodes as two LEDs, this thing would be operating at uh, 50 hertz. So you'd get uh, the one LED goes on on the positive half cycle and the other LED would go on on the negative half cycle. As it is, I'm just using half the cycle. So that thing is actually flicking, but you cannot see it. I cannot see it at all. There's no flicking at all. It also means when you do calculations like this, because you're only using the half cycle, you should really take into account that uh, you may want to leave uh, the resistor a little bit lower than usual. So you want to pass more current through it because you're really only getting half the, the light coming out of there because it's uh, switched off on uh, every half cycle. But the calculations I did and the experiments I did leave me satisfied that this is great. Now, the way it was before, you could hardly see it. I'm happy. Just as a side note, when I was getting the front panel ready to put it in, I decided to do a full cleanup on this. And again, some weird things happened. Somebody's been in here even to the point of having removed the speaker because one of the screws was missing. I removed all these little panels. They all come out, screws at the back, clean them properly, uh, clean the actual faceplate, the actual um, enclosure and uh, the knobs and put it all back. And it, it's looking really, really great. There's very little wrong with this uh, front panel. There's a little bit of a scuff over there, but very little wrong with it. And the knobs are all, all great. They're all in perfect condition. They were dirty, but that's easy to sort out. But I really find it amazing. Why would someone have removed the speaker and, um, and then not put the screws back? I, I don't know what happened to this radio. I really don't know why someone went to this extreme of actually dismantling stuff that just doesn't make sense. If they were cleaning it up to put it back together, I mean, you do what, what I've done. You make sure you've got the screws in, get all the screws, or at least find replacement screws. But this is weird. It's weirder and weirder and weirder. And what is weirder is now that this thing is receiving. Last night I tried this again. I was getting a reception on shortwave on all the bands. And at one point it just flicked off and then came back on again. In other words, the reception or well, the issue that this thing was having at the beginning showed its uh, reared its ugly head again, and then it was back to normal. So I couldn't catch it, you know, in 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 a bad condition, uh, in order to to sort of try and figure out what the hell was going on. There is one thing I've noticed right now, and that has got to do with that guy there. You see that little element of that display is off. Just the bottom one. And that's happened before, which is really strange. It could just be a contact issue. Again, it's a problem that comes and goes. Really, really strange. This is, um, I think, I don't think that's driven individually. I've got to look at the schematic again. 
So I really don't, don't understand why that element would not be on. It's not burnt, it's working because I've seen it working. It's just that occasionally, you see that? It's off. So that's another mystery that's uh, going to keep me busy for a while. But as I said, I'm waiting for some components, I'm waiting for some uh, ICs, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping that this thing will, I'll just leave it on. I'll leave it on for a long time to try and get this thing to actually fail. And um, I haven't been successful so far. <laughs> it's really weird. When you want it to fail, it doesn't. When you don't, it does. But uh, the idea is that I'll leave it on, try and get this thing to, or try and at least recognize the pattern of the failure. Figure out why it is that it fails. Because the last thing I want, this radio belongs to a friend of mine in London. The last thing I want is to send the thing back to him, test it all before it's done. He gets it there, switches it on, and the bloody thing fails on him. It, th this is Murphy's Law, so I want, to, I want to catch it instead of having this radio sent back to him uh, with the same issue or with an issue. All right, I'm going to leave you for now. I'm not sure what I'm going to do next week. If these components arrive, if this thing fails in the meantime, I'll be back on this one. Otherwise, I'm going to put this thing to the side. I'm going to start a new project. And this one will always be on standby till the uh, components arrive, until I figure out what the hell's going on. I may have to do something which I really don't like doing, which is sort of start on a board and just replace a lot of components. That is a stupid way of doing it. But sometimes if something is just intermittent, you know, as long as this thing keeps fading at me, on me, even once, I know that I haven't found the problem. You can look at the schematic as much as you like. You know, when you follow the signals and you find the signals are there, what else can you do? Really just give it time. So that's where I'm going to leave you for now. Uh, obviously, I'll be showing one last video sometime with another project in between, but uh, to show you the final result, um, I've got some work to do on the paneling at the back. I may, I may try and rebuild this flap. I'm not sure that I can, but with my little experimentations on 3D printing, I may try and do that. There is something else that I've done. I've ordered resin printed gears. So if and when those arrive, I want to see how they work. If they are in good condition, I'm going to um, try and put them in here, see if they uh, look and feel better than the 3D printed uh, filament ones that I've done. So I'll be showing you that pretty soon. So I'll have to take this all apart again. This one's going to be uh, standing around here for a little while longer. Once again, I hope you've enjoyed this so far. And um, if you did like it, click like, share, subscribe and all that jazz. And if you want to support the channel, you can do so on Patreon and PayPal. Links on the description below. Thanks for watching. Bye for now and stay safe.